Hi everyone. I have now played my first RTT of 10th edition and I won. I think the event went pretty well as a whole. The game is still very weird and there's a lot of pending balance issues, which I think everyone's kind of just like waiting on now uh, that will probably greatly impact the game in the future. But I've arrived at a list that I'm very happy with for the time being. I mean, Warhammer is a game of concept adaptation, right? Things change so frequently. I feel like usually wins events are the people who are fastest to react and uh, develop new metas so i've arrived at something that i feel like is good for the state of the game we're living in right now while people are still figuring out stuff and some things are probably a little more powerful than they should be but yeah i, I placed first it was a it was a relatively small rtt but a lot of the people there were like what i would consider like very good players who've played against before uh, in ninth eighth and some of them even seventh some of the players there were like what i would consider like a very high caliber so i, I was honestly kind of surprised and not expecting to win the whole thing and was really proud I was able to do so. But yeah, I mean, I've won a lot of RTTs and GTs and never quite a major, but often close before. But uh, yeah, winning the first one of 10 felt good. A lot of planning went into this list and I was really uh, pleasantly surprised to see that I was able to execute it. I played like four and some change practice games with works prior to this uh, with a variety of different lists and uh, approaches to the game. Um, and given the state of the game and what I was expecting, this is something I came up with uh, as a direct response to that. This list, I think, works because of what I was expecting to see and did see at the event and what other people were expecting to see at the event. I think it's not like the like best than beatable 40k list ever, but I think it's like very, very strong. So I know a lot of people in the competitive scene or just people in general seem down on orcs. I think they're like an incredibly strong faction. I'm really, really into them right now and excited to keep playing games with them. I think the reason people are down on them, though, is because people are trying to beat the heaviest hitters in the game the factions that can just like deal 30 plus mortal wounds to you consistently i mean 30 feels like a conservative number like comparing themselves to that and being like how do i do that like what is the game for max damage output for me if you approach orcs from that angle i do think that it'll uh, be a pretty difficult game for you this list tries to do what i think is orcs greatest strength which is just like an insane quantity of cheap units and incredible mission play. In all three of my games, I scored 100. Or, well, uh, one of them has scored 100 for real. And then uh, the other two were talked out once I had to reach 75 points on turn four. And my opponent was somewhere in the 20s or 30s. And uh, they uh, conceded and we drew cards quickly, talked out the rest of the game and came to the conclusion that I could have scored 100 over turns four and five without actually playing it. If you're new to tournaments, this is like a relatively common practice. If both players agree and you are able to feasibly, realistically go over the remaining events of like speeding through them. But yeah, I, I feel confident that this list has the ability to consistently score 100. And uh, I mean, it's Warhammer, right? Like luck and uh, other variables play into this. But I, I think like if you're playing it well on most missions consistently, this is like something it should be able to do. Before going to more detail, I'll just break down the list and I'll go over specific things that happened in the games and uh, yeah, how the tournament went as a whole. So starting off, we have a uh, beast boss. Uh, he joins a unit of beast naga boys. Not surprising. We have a war boss with follow me lads. He is with the knobs because they're insane together. I, I would consider taking two knob squads of war boss each in the future. Uh, I'm not sure yet though, because it does feel a little anti-synergistic to what the rest of the list is trying to do, but having at least like one big delete button was very useful to have. And their yeah, their their offensive output into a lot of units at least is like quite good. Uh, three units of ten beast naga boys, uh each inside of a truck. Two units of 10 Choppa boys and the trucks. There are six trucks. The remaining truck that doesn't have boys in it is filled with the knobs. Uh, three units of Grots on foot. They're 11 mans now because of the run herder. Three units of three Squig Hog boys. These guys, uh, I was really down on at first, but I like them now that I've played with them. I don't, their damage output is okay. There's some targets like light vehicles they're like great into. They are able to get through and kill a few Terminators, uh, even though they're only AP1 with the volume of attacks they have. Two damage shirts on uncommon from them to be able to just like spike if your opponent fails a bunch of saves and kill models of a two-up save. But uh, yeah, they're they're pretty durable and your opponent has to put like actual resources into killing them. Uh, T7, uh, sometimes with a minus one to wound, which I used a few times in my games, the five up Fiona pain with a four up save that was often a three up because they're receiving the benefit of cover is like not the hard 
artist profile to kill an all 40k but for 110 points i like them a lot three by five stormball units these are probably the best unit in my army they're the ones that i was the most thankful for and impressed by throughout the weekend they're super good for just like oh i need to score a like capture enemy outpost and my opponent didn't really like leave that much on his back line or it's just like five of those i don't even know what they're called the 35 point imperial unit that everybody's taking but has like a five up funeral pain just like a couple of those guys back there well storm boys can advance and charge and like flip the point it can score or engage really easily and like access multiple table quarters from their starting point oftentimes they can move to an objective that's kind of far away from the start of a turn and cleanse um all that stuff uh, they're they're incredible at that role two units of three war bikes kind of similar um i like the war bikes too they're a little more durable than the storm boys obviously but not being infantry and not being able to hide them and bounce through walls as much um hurts them a little so i uh, i like the war bikes still but i, I would consider something else there in the future if i if, if, if i'm trying to put like um another squad of knobs in and probably dropping you know the boys or beast nagas to compensate for that as well i'll, I'll start going over uh, some of the individual games and uh, start going over the tournament as a whole so my three matchups were tower round one neck rounds round two and i played against this was definitely the hardest and most interesting and like distinctly 10th game of the three uh gray knights with a allied uh castellan knight round three which is a pretty crazy. I'll go over that list and how that game went later. I did not play against Eldar in this tournament, but I have played against a list that was like a little meme but I think like still very effective. Eldar list, which consisted of three Wraith Knights, which uh, we know is not the optimal number, but still a uh, very formidable one. It's hard to deal with. Uh, my friend Eddie, yeah, he's a very good Eldar player, and I told him just to like bring like the strongest list he could think of when Tan first came out. Two, three, pi no, three fire prisms, uh, a bunch of weapon platforms. Uh, yeah, I don't know. You can you can kind of guess most of it, probably. The first practice game I played against that was kind of like conventional work list, which I think most people are like trying to do right now. My list had like Gaz, two units of knobs, I think. It was like that kind of approach, right? Just like, well, I'll just try and play like a army that looks like it hits relatively hard and see how that goes. The answer is just gets tabled by turn three and you can't really do that much. Um, it's really hard to interact with them. The damage output is just way too much between towering and the amount of dev wounds that they can produce it was too much i was like this is impossible I, I felt like his army struggled to do tactical secondaries and didn't really have a great plan for a fixed one unless i gave up like assassinate and bring it down which uh, might have been the ones he took i can't remember the first list i made had a ton of characters and i think a lot of people were falling into a trap of orcs where you bring a ton of characters because they're like exciting when you see them initially but i think it's a trap i think it'll just give your opponent a lot of access to assassinate even if they take tactical it's not fixed like the turn on which they draw assassinate will probably be incredibly easy for them and i feel like orcs are best if they are doing everything possible to keep your opponent's points low uh you really just don't want them to be able to score or have a meaningful way to get a lead on your army at any point throughout the game you want to deny their primary first and foremost but also try and make their secondary game as hard as you possibly can and uh yeah after that game i tried a list that was not this one but kind of similar and it went much much better or just like as many units as possible thinking about the mission first eldar and thousand sons both really good at like and marines too they're really good at like nuking a couple big targets but they struggle to kill a million units fast i'm sure there's games where that can happen but it's like certainly a lot harder to present them with more targets than they know what to do with and overwhelm them while denying their primary than it is to just like walk at them with something that could reasonably kill them in melee if it ever gets there which it most likely won't in the current state of the game yeah i didn't end up playing elder thousand sons this event um i i do feel confident that this army could be certain elder players at least i think thousand sons are a very good army i'm not really overly worried about that matchup of this list though i don't think they have enough tools to kill them effectively yeah like that stated i i have a lot of concerns about 10th as a whole uh i'm like worried about the future of the game but uh, i'm still optimistic about the future long term and uh, I don't want to be like a doomer about it either because it feels like unproductive. Yeah, I, I have a lot of problem with the core rules, which I'll keep going over through a little bit in this video and throughout future ones too. I'm, I'm not super worried about index balance as it currently stands, at least in orcs relationship to like the top armies, because I think the ones that are currently targets will get toned down. Games Workshop is like pretty consistently good at doing this. If there's something people scream and complain loud enough, 
uh, rightly or wrongly, they they usually do something to down tune it pretty quick. And in this case, I think it would be very right for them to down tune some of the top armies quickly and uh, ideally boost some of the ones that I consider like lower factions. But I don't know if that'll happen as soon. I feel like we've been playing Super Smash Brothers Melee for a long time and are now uh, waking up to a universe where we can only play Brawl. That's enough preface. I'll just start going over the games now. This one was against Tal on Hammer and Anvil, which uh, if anyone's played it in Ninth Edition, this was like not something you typically wanted as orcs uh, to have a hammer and anvil mission against Tau. If your if your goal is to just like simply engage them in melee and kill them, which this was not. We played with player place terrain, so uh, I made sure to try and put. I think he was defender, but after his first drop, which I think was something to just make it so that he would have clear line of sight to one of the objectives, I placed a ruin to block the other one so that I could hide the whole game there. And there was a uh, ruin in the center of the board, which uh, he moved six inches as his first drop as per the rules of player place terrain. The center of the objective is on the other side of the wall. It's kind of hard to see here, but the beast boss is not standing on it. Basically just had like too much stuff for him to be able to do anything about. The mission was supply drop too. Here I have the, he got a deploy teleport homer as his first secondary and was able to do so with that uh, stealth suit you can see there uh, on my first turn i got attempting target and secure no man's land which are both like super easy for works to score on his second turn he got attempting target uh which isn't the objective that i had in the first picture the one that's just like covered in stuff above that ruin which you can't really see here like up that way is another ruin that created a really good um uh, like overlapping field of obscuring terrain. So it was hard for him to see this truck and these Quake Hogs. Crisis suits are vehicles now, so it's difficult for them to uh, maneuver in the same way they previously could. Uh, they can't just pass through ruins anymore or go over buildings because of the change to the fly. Uh, they, they felt like their damage output was very good, but they were relatively slow. And uh, their their tankiness was immense, too. It was, it was hard to deal with them. Uh, I, I tried to mostly ignore most of his stuff and killed only what I needed to. Like, as you can see here, the, these beast nagas are not running forward into incoming Tau fire. Uh, they aren't just, like, bum-rushing him, hoping they survive the shooting, which they probably wouldn't have in getting over. Uh, I'm move-blocking him with trucks, like this truck up here. It's just like trying to screen out with some other units that uh, you can't see in this photo from him like effectively moving past the midfield to reach me. So he has to clear like all of this like random bullshit and chaff that's like towards the front and can't reach this objective. And if he ever were able to do so, uh, there would be so much stuff for him to have to kill. Another important note is that this tournament treated, uh, I think, two ruins per player as infinite in height and windowless just as a response to towering the majority of terrain features were still able to be seen over by towering models but they felt like it was unfair for every ruin uh, as they're currently modeled at this particular store to have windows and not always like taller than a wraith knight to be infinite in height i was able to use that to my advantage too uh, it didn't it really impact this game because he didn't have any towering models I, I expect a lot of tournaments to start adopting this in the future too on my next turn turn two i got uh, assassination which i dropped and uh, extend battle lines, which is another one that's pretty easy to do. Pretty easy for this list, at least, to do. You have to control an objective in my deployment zone and one in no man's land. The mission supply trap doesn't give you points for uh, the objectives in no man's land. Um, the only reason those grots are there is A, to screen his unit of crisis suits, his second unit of crisis suits and a crisis commander that was with them in reserve. So he couldn't deploy my back line and shoot the boys in this ruin over here. And also, uh, grots get a chance to generate a CP and a four up if they're standing on objective. So being able to string out the grots everywhere gave me a lot of chances to get a CP on a four up, which is immensely useful. Orcs really, really need CP. I feel like most games, um, I was only ever at more than like two or three CP if I was saving them. In order to use orcs has never beaten. This truck here, one up to the middle of the field, turn one, it's like final movement. And then in turn two, I called the log and disembarked all of the knobs inside. They uh, advanced through this building and then charged the crisis suits that you can kind of see over here here's the left side of the board this is the knobs after they fought the crisis suits he started with six plus the character in this unit uh they were able to kill four of the war boss Again, crisis suits are very tanky i think i rolled maybe below average but i i popped unbridled carnage on these two i mean it still wasn't really enough to kill the full unit it felt like a below average roll but not incredibly below average uh, i think they're just like a, a tough unit to deal with the peace naga boys are just tagging everything they can over here Vehicles can still shoot out of combat with a minus one, but uh, a minus one, especially of an army like Tau, 
what has like a base ballistic skill four up and it goes to like a three when they're uh, guided or spotted or whatever it's called now you can have like a unit choose to spot for another tau unit which he was using these guys i forget what they're called the like little forge world uh it's just like a cheap vehicle that's really useful for having as an extra spotter. He would have been shooting at a 4-up going to a 3-up normally. and said he went from a 5-up to a 4-up with his hammerheads, which uh, did make a difference. I was able to keep my trucks alive for a little bit longer, and he had to put more shooting into like the knobs and boys and other stuff as a result. Yeah, here's here's a better photo of all that stuff. There's the truck down here. I'm just trying to move block this little pass along the squake hogs. So I, I, I just moved all of this stuff so that uh, he wasn't going to be able to end the movement of his hammerheads or these guys or the crisis suits or anything really like over here. Uh, I pre-measured out to make sure they could reach there. Uh, they couldn't really reach anywhere that would be like meaningful to denying my primary on the other side while still keeping his primary at zero for, I think, three turns. So eventually uh, that big beast Naga boy cluster, once his only threat to this back line uh, was put down, which was the crisis units that he had in reserve, he put them over here to help deal with this objective and some stuff that was previously over here. I knew that the only real way he could get over there was like having these guys make it past the grots and bikes here, which I think were positioned out so that the whole unit wouldn't have been able to land there. Yeah, and like previously in Naim, he would have been able to go into this building with the crisis suits, right? Um, but because of the way like fly works now, he didn't have quite enough movement to like get up here with all of them and still legally land. And uh, he uh, is an infantry, so we can't just walk in a uh, building and then shoot through. He had to go all the way around uh, to what's just like some more grots and trucks and stuff move blocking over here. Uh, I believe this is turn three in this photo. Uh, on my turn three, I had attempting target and storm. No, he had attempting target and storm hop style objective. Uh, attempting target he never got. It was, again, this objective over here. Pretty difficult for him. Then storm hostile objective, he was able to flip this one that my mouse cursor is currently on. Yeah, at, at this point, at the end of turn three, he felt pretty confident that he wasn't going to be able to catch up on primary or secondary. And uh, we were both taking a long time, too, just because we were uh, double-checking a lot of rules for 10th and changes, uh, not really so much in our own data sheets, but to the core rules themselves. Double-checking the phrasing and pile in and consolidate uh, came up constantly. Some interactions of like characters, mix saves, and Fiona pains, too. So, uh, yeah, we, we had reached turn three. I was ahead at that point by... You know, we did do a little bit of turn four. I think the score was 75 me, 21 him. And he just said there was like no way that he could catch up. So we, uh, we called it. This is, I'm looking at the tabletop battles app for reference. I think that's what happened. I don't know if this was logged completely accurate or not, but I definitely ended up scoring uh, what would have been 100, but we forgot to put in 10 points for painting. So it ended up at 90, which is still like obviously a very fine score. Going into round two, this was against Necrons. The appointment was sweeping engagement and the mission. Oh, cool. I didn't write the mission down here. Awesome. Yeah, I don't know what mission it was, but uh, for sweeping engagement was for sure the deployment type. Uh, in the previous game, I forgot to mention, my opponent went first uh, and in this game i went first which uh made a big difference uh this is a very blurry photo it doesn't really help that much uh okay so this is uh around the end of my turn one movement he deployed his warriors a bit too close i don't i don't think he realized they could like kill as many warriors as they did i got some pretty high advance rolls here too these beast things started all the way back here behind this ruin and trucks uh i disembarked them uh wogged turn one uh yeah ended up here we learned a lot about pile and consolidation in 10th this game there's a lot of changes oh for reference these storm boys on the top floor or on the bottom floor it's just like easier this is like common i think but in case anyone doesn't know, um, it's just like easier sometimes to put models in the top and just like reach into the bottom of a building. Uh, Squig Hogs advanced up here on this flank, the 10 inches. And I think like at least two of them, if not all three, got like sixes for their advance roll. So it made this charge like relatively easy. He also put his Locust Destroyer within an inch of the wall, as well as some Immortals who were like over here, which was just like something he probably shouldn't have done. Uh, but he was nice enough to say he like uh, didn't want to take it back either and was fine with them being there and squig hogs charged in killed the locust uh killed the immortals here and then killed the immortals here uh, okay so this interaction was really weird this is something that made me realize how different piling in and consolidating in 10th is so on the other side of this wall here there's a bunch of flayed ones this ended up <laughs> the, the tag itself ended up not mattering because you realize later that the monolith is able to remove these guys from combat and uh without making them like fall back but uh i really wanted to tag his destroyers so they couldn't shoot me next turn so i'll i'll read the consolidate rules real quick and then we can go back to this example there's there's a lot of like strange interactions that uh feel like not very intuitive if you haven't seen it i made a video about the charge phase the other day i will continue to talk about the charge phase in videos this 
this is like something I didn't go over in that. That is like a, a huge difference that has some wackiness to it. Okay, so the real estate for consolidation to be possible, a unit must be able to end these moves of an engagement range of one or more enemy units and a unit coherency. If these conditions cannot be met, then each model in that unit can instead make a consolidation move towards the closest objective marker, but only if after doing so, that unit is within range of that objective marker and a unit coherency. Uh, one interesting thing about this is that they don't have to move like closer to the closest objective marker. They can just move towards it. So you're able to like freely shuffle your guys around on the objective with consolidation move. Uh, this was useful in the Grey Knights game during one instance where my uh, boys were tied up in combat against a knight that they had no hope of killing. But I was able to shuffle some of the ones like in front in a different direction to fit ones from the back onto the objective so I could out uh, OC the Castellan knight. And this is the part that was relevant in this game. If a unit it can end its consolidation with an engagement range of one or more enemy units then each time one of its models makes a consolidation move it must end that move closer to the closest enemy model if it can also which would be the flayed ones in this instance um if it can also end that move in base-to-base -base contact with one or more enemy models while still satisfying all of the conditions above it must do so the controlling player chooses the order in which to move their models so it must end that move closer to the closest enemy model if it can also end that move in base-to-base -base contact with one or more enemy models while still satisfying all the conditions above it must do so we had to read this like five times flayed ones are here they're the closest enemy unit they're not something i want to tag it'll be a mistake a lot of these guys will die what i want to tag is up here i started off i think it was like 2.7 inches away from the flayed ones and ended this move about two inches away from them so still outside of an inch if there wasn't a wall here I would have been able to end within base contact with them. But because there's a wall here and I can't end my movement in the wall, and also the wall technically prevents you from being in base to base contact, there might be something in the terrain rules that gets around this. But either way, I wouldn't have been able to fit my base on this side of the wall where the flayed one was. So base to base contact was not possible in this instance. Uh, I was still able to move three inches up to get closer to the flayed ones and engage this unit. Well, not ending within engagement range at all of the flayed ones or in base to base contact with them because it was not possible possible due to the terrain. Yeah, weird dynamic. Uh, I'm going to keep an eye out for that a lot in the future. I think it will come up fairly often. It would also make things like this charge here. Like if you're charging an enemy unit on the other side of a wall. Yeah, one thing that came up a lot that I didn't really process until this game is like how different it is to have a lot of small units that are charging a target. Like these Squake Hogs, for instance, in 9th edition, say like I wanted all of these to charge a unit that was like here. I could position one Squake Hog here one squig hug here and then one here right next to the um, building and then have the rest just like kind of string back so at least like a couple models if not three from each squig hog unit could have attacked here uh that's not possible in 10th because like say i charged with this unit first and they have like a he has just like a wall of models right here um they would all have to end in base to base contact because it would have been like physically possible to do so so uh, so i would have charge blocked the other two squig hog units uh, this happened in this combat over here with a bunch of Beast Naga boys who I wanted to then have uh, Storm boys charge into the reanimator too. But because the Beast Nagas had to end in base to base contact, I couldn't charge in if anything else. They had the movement to completely surround it no matter what I did, so I had to do so. The ways to get around that is like if there wasn't a big warrior blob here and it's just like what you see currently, like if I multi charged multiple units, I probably could have strung it out. So there is like four Beast Nagas into base to base contact here, like two or three here, and then like one here. That would have allowed my units over here to make it into like say like this unit wanted to charge the reanimator and these wanted to charge the reanimator if i charge with the storm boys first and then like had a couple on base to base and these back ones wouldn't be able to make it in because they didn't have as long of a charge um then i could have left more room for these beast nagas to wrap around this side of the reanimator but if i did it in the reverse order and the beast nagas got like a huge charge i might not have been able to do so back to the consolidation point like here i have more freedom because I'm not able to get into base to base contact here to like move closer to his unit and still end with an engagement range, but not base him. Like there's a little, I think there's like instances where you might be able to like shuffle these guys like technically closer, like say his units like here. And I want this guy to get around because I'm not in base to base contact. I like still can because of the wall, which could make room for like something like uh, this squake cock here. Currently, like, I mean, in this example, he's being like move blocked, right? But like, say like this guy goes here first and then like he goes over a little bit. I could potentially make room for the squake hog base if there's something here i wanted to engage uh these these are all the changes between 9th and 10th that i think are going to be like a huge headache to understand and take a lot of time to process but uh, i'm slowly getting the, the hang of them more
to, to <laughs> injuries defense uh he his list is a little like mimi as you can see there's a monolith here just because it's like one of his favorite models and he wanted to try it out he uh he played the game very well i think but he, he definitely wasn't running like what could be like the most optimal necron list ever uh and we both knew that i think like necrons are just like a really strong faction i, I think there's a lot of cool stuff you can do with them um he also didn't have any tomb blades which are like pretty essential i think for mission play in tenth uh and he only had 10 lich guard instead of what so a lot of people seem to be running 20 right now uh again like who knows what's good right but it's like what the internet and uh random people online seem to think is good so yeah he, he didn't die fully into that he just wanted to run the units he liked the most let's see we got some other fun pictures uh here's uh my war boss riding in a big track I got to finish painting him and the big track itself. Um, I, I ran it as a truck. Like everything weird you see is just the truck. I'm, I'm like a big competitive player, obviously, but I also just really love like modeling and kit bashing. So yeah, I, I, I don't want to win with works or play it off. I'm not doing it in style. This is the truck. This is a truck I used to use it as a squig buggy. Uh, this is an old armor cast battle wagon that's closer to truck size. So currently I use it as that. Here they're move blocking the monolith. The monolith's combat profile is like actually pretty fucking good. And I didn't want it to reach any of the stuff I had like down here. So I kept throwing little garbage units in front that he had to deal with instead of being able to reach down there. You have to be careful when screening like this because it does allow him to get extra movement. Like if the monolith charged here, it's like getting an extra like four inch move than it would have previously. But uh, yeah, like careful screening can really mess up uh, like big models like this trying to get through things because it's, it's Titanic. So it can like end walk over stuff, right? But it still can't end its move on models. So if you position carefully enough, you can still move block Titanic models. The Lich Guard were really difficult to deal with in this matchup. This is before they disembarked. I forget which truck they're in. I think there's knobs maybe in this truck here. Um, they uh, they disembarked. The Lich Guard have a fight first ability, which is hard in the orc or in this specific work matchup because all my tools are melee. They're only OC1, but there's like enough of them that I do have to deal with them if I want him to keep his primary down. Uh, orcs has never beaten this so good. It's a great way to get her own fight first for orcs. Um, it's it's an incredibly powerful stratagem that I think pushes their melee like pretty high. And uh, like orc melee potential is down as a whole compared to ninth, but things like this make it. Uh, still like very very spicy and tanf and uh it's important to also remember that uh lethality is on paper down across the board which is not true i think the game is currently more lethal than it was at the end of ninth but at a, at a high level at least uh if those things that are currently more lethal than they were probably intended to be are toned down then i, I think yeah we'll end up in a place where orcs melee doesn't feel that subpar relative to the damage output of other factions in the game uh, okay, here we are. Uh, this is the knobs that's embarking. This uh, boy, in case anyone calls me out on this, he's uh, this knob isn't here. He's like uh, here in this part of the building, but it was like a pain to like reach in to put him on the other side, and they were still like within coherency wrapped around the objective. Yeah, the big melee in the middle ended up with all the Lich Guard dying. Both characters survived, and then the Beast Snag is were able to kill uh, one of the characters in the following turn. This is another game that ended, I, I believe, on turn three or four. He conceded. I had a 40 point lead, and uh, he decided he was not going to be able to catch up or table me fast enough. I think if we played all five turns, he would kill everything except for maybe like 30 grots and a couple bike units, uh, which is like not an undesirable outcome. Uh, this army isn't like insanely durable. It's a lot of stuff. But the main point of it is like to keep your opponent's score so low for turns two and three that they uh, effectively cannot catch up on the, the the final turns of the game. And there's like some missions that make this easier for them, right? Like the first mission I played, there was like the Alpha Omega one. And uh, my opponent, we ruled that he would probably be able to score 15 uh, at the end of the game because I would not have anything left at that point to reasonably contest the like final objective that's left when all the other ones are pulled. But even those 15 points in primary wouldn't have been enough for him to catch up. Throughout the game, I'm always like thinking about my points and my opponent's points and trying to reverse engineer a score. So, okay, so I'm like five points ahead next turn I can probably be 15 ahead if I get any of these tactical secondaries if I get these I'll probably be a little far down and like it's hard to keep track of everything like there's just too many variables to like effectively do that but I try to at least uh, think about what secondaries I've had so far what secondaries I could get and then the same for my opponent and uh, yeah just keep a, a, a light note of that throughout the game I don't like using no pad or anything while playing I know some people that do but uh, yeah I, I like to like bear those parameters in mind and it's pretty important if you're trying to win off playing the mission alone too
have like some pulse on that even if it's not completely accurate you want to do a like vibe check on how it feels uh the the score is going and uh how much more you need to kill like of their army or deny of their points in order to keep the score low for them the game three was the hardest one against the weirdest list let me uh try and find it for you uh yeah i mean everything's like so fresh it's hard to get used to all right so he had a, a brother captain with the sigil of exigence, uh, a grandmaster with first of a fray, uh, Caldor Drago, a squad of paladins with uh, side cannons, a squad of paladins with uh, incinerators, another squad of paladins with uh, side cannons, a purgation squad with incinerators, two extraction squads, that's what they're called, Inquisitor Codias, who just hung out in the back farming CP, and a Knight Castellan. Uh, which was very big, and uh, I just mostly tried to ignore it. The mission was Vital Ground, and the deployment was Search and Destroy. Oh, fuck. Okay, so it looks like I mostly forgot to take pictures until after the game. Uh, I'll just, like, go over it. Uh, this is the terrain we had. That is accurate. His first drop, he was Defender. It was placing this piece of light cover right here, which was the right play. That's the last thing I wanted. My next drop... Oh, for player place terrain, too, we're using, like, the new Frontline Gaming, or ITC, or whatever deployment where like for this deployment it's like the diagonal it's like a line from here to here my first drop was this ruin we treated this one as not having windows and being infinite in height so his castellan wasn't able to shoot through it i think the remaining this might have been his next drop just because he didn't want me to put anything obscuring in the middle and then the rest of the placement didn't really matter uh this was here to give my truck some cover against his uh psi cannons which made a difference. Uh, there's a bunch of Grots here just kind of doing their thing and trying to zone him out. Granites have an ability. They have a couple abilities that are like really fucking strong. Uh, uh, they feel like, I mean, not like, an, like absolutely not like a broken army, but like some mechanics that feel like maybe they're a little further than they uh, were, <laughs> were intended to be on paper. Um, so you can come within three inches through Deep Strike Reserve. You can put units back into reserve i think two units during my player turn through multiple means and uh if he comes up in three he can't uh charge but boy can he shoot i was really hard to screen him out like i have a million models in my army and it was still difficult this is uh yeah this is at the end of the game the castellan was not over here he was like over here but he was just like packing so he got brought over to that side okay so this is where <laughs> most of the game was actually decided gray knights have a rule where if you move i don't know how i like i don't know i i trust that whatever he was doing was like like absolutely legal but I forget just like specifically how the breakdown works. He can, I believe, take two units, maybe one, um, when I move within uh, nine of them and then put them back into the teleport strike and then like come back down during the reinforcement steps of his following turn. Again, within three for like a CP. So yeah, very, very strong. He had a unit here, I think like hoping that I would come with a nine of it and that he could just like dip them. And then uh, the mission we were playing was sticky. He still would have controlled this without them being there. This was turn one. He went first. He shot a bunch of stuff, killed like, uh, I don't know, like some trucks and boys and squig hogs and storm boys with the Castellan and the side cannon shooting. Yeah, uh, decided to play his game of chicken. Disembarked or moved. I think three units of beast nagas, the knobs, the squig hogs, the bikes, and the storm boys all right here. And then just started banking for nine inch charges, starting with the knobs who I knew were a unit that could actually like legitimately hurt them. And everybody else would just like probably kill a couple and die in return. And because I have so many pieces to trade with, that was a trade I was willing to make. I got really lucky. Uh, my first charge with the knobs was like a three, I think, but I rerolled it into an 11. So they were able to connect, even without Wog, like cleaned up the squad that was here. All that was left was, I think it was Drago, was one of his characters was left in the unit, uh, who's not that much of a threat by himself. Uh, great, Grey Nuts are really strong though. His, his list was like, I wish I understood like, how to recap it better because it was i was like genuinely very impressed by it. it it feels like something i can see becoming like a staple or like a common build down the line the knight is just like big uh lumbers around and uh blast the shit out of stuff all all his great knights were like incredibly hard to engage in melee and basically for every single one like he kept doing this throughout the game i just had to line up a bunch of units and then just like sweat while hoping something rolled a nine and enough times throughout the game I was able to do so. Uh, his overwatching of flamers was like like really, really strong too. Uh, this was a Psy Cannon squad I charged, so he didn't overwatch me. Or I think, no, right, he overwatched earlier that turn. I think he overwatched like one of the units I like moved here. It was like a, like 10 Beast Nagas or something um, and picked them up, I'm pretty sure. But uh, yeah, this is like another thing where all of the Orc units can come into play. Uh, like if you're able to position stuff 
so that um you can deny his overwatch and then like you have you have so many units like storm boys that can just like eat overwatch still and like charge from like out of line of sight to tag a unit and tie them up here and then you can charge in with like your knobs or whatever also uh, a disembark doesn't count as a move i believe it's a separate action uh, i gotta double check this but i think you can disembark from a truck without it counting as a move so the unit that disembarked does not uh is not eligible to be overwatched against it's another like tool to look out for and uh keep an eye in throughout your games yeah i mean it's the same deal as the other games i uh i just like had a huge primary lead i uh once i captured this objective all he had here was uh, like the inquisitor that was like farming points he really doesn't have that many units so it's hard for him to be like everywhere and even in the sticky objective game he just needed his stuff elsewhere but this was the mission where if you control your opponent's primary objective you get eight points during each command phase uh another thing that uh, came up this game that was um pretty interesting is uh these beast nagas over here were in a truck that died when they disembark, they're battle shocked, which at first they thought meant that they couldn't like you can't have the pinata trick that was common in ninth for like a truck dies or at that time kill rig would die. The models inside disembark, stand on the objective, and then the objective is yours in the following turn. But because if the unit's like over half strength, they test for battle shock, which they automatically pass because they're above half strength, before you see if you control the objective or not. So if a truck dies, guys get out, have OC zero on your opponent's turn, they still have their normal OC during your turn. So like he had a, I mean, there's a bunch that work like this, but he had secure no man's land on um, this objective. He was trying to get it. He had like this one and this one. He was trying to get the five. The knight was standing here and on his turn, he was able to score it. He controlled both objectives. And then on my turn, I controlled this because my beast knight is automatically past battle shock at the start of a turn because they're above half strength, and then they have OC2, so I outnumbered the Castellan and controlled the point still. Weird interaction. I don't know if this will get FAQ'd or something, but it's good to know that you can have, like, trucks die, and as long as the unit inside is above half strength, when they get out, um, they'll just pass Battle Shock the following turn. So if anyone, if I'm wrong in this, like, someone please let me know. Like, I'm trying to just genuinely get as a best that Warhammer 10th edition as I can, and I want to learn everything. So, uh, yeah, if uh, if this is not the case, like, I'd love to hear counter arguments, but we went over the rules, and to our understanding, that's how it worked. These guys are in the corner because he had a uh, Terminator squad back here, or Paladins, yeah, Paladin squad back here uh that they just all like slammed into and i think the only model left was there's like a character here i yeah i mean the whole game was just like praying for nine inch charges with enough units and hoping i got one or two of them and uh, i happened to I, I think if we do this matchup over and over again he will win a percentage of them i think this is still steered in the orc's favor like i just have like too many tools for him to reasonably kill most games but like if I just fail every single night in charge, I think he does eventually table me. Uh, and I can see a world in which I'm not able to max points based on draw. But I, I, I just, I still feel like, and this is also mostly just because my opponent Daniel is like a good player who like knows the game very well. If this was like somebody else and I was playing the orc still, I, I think like I, I'd probably do just win this matchup most of the time. If people start building whatever counters six trucks and a million boys, it will probably like lose its footing. But Right now, it is like absolutely the opposite of what people are trying to build. And you can do the same sort of thing with different armies. Like if you don't play orcs and you're watching this, like GSC, I think can maybe honestly even do this better than orcs can. Guard feel like they could be good at this too. They don't quite have the movement, but they sure have like access to a lot of uh, cheap units and um, OC too. Um, potentially Tyranids, I'm not sure. I'd have to, I'm not that familiar with 10th edition Tyranids yet, but I can absolutely see Tyranids having something like this where you're just like having as many small units as possible. Um, and I think like if you're not one of the big heavy hitters that is playing the table you plan, you cannot beat them at their own game. You have to do something different. You have to sidestep. And I'm really glad I was able to like prove that that can in some capacity work this weekend. And uh, in my practice game against Eldar too. It's a it's a weird new world. Takeaways on 10th overall after this. Um, it really does just feel like playing like Super Smash Brothers of items on or something. I, I love the missions. I think they're fun. I know a lot, their reviews of the missions from like tournament people I know have been pretty mixed. I think they're cool. Even Servo Skulls, it's like, that's like, that's a Mario Party mission. Like we know if it's not going to be like the finals of LVO or whatever. It's just like a cool thing if you and your friends want to like mix it up and do something different. Like I love boarding actions. I think that it did like an awesome job with that expansion. Um, but I loved it because it's like a different way to play the game. 
I think they're trying to, for now, at least make most of 40K like boarding actions. Boarding actions has these problems too, but I feel like like my friend group and I didn't really care because it's boarding actions. It's like something we do like uh, to take a break from 40K and take the game like less uh, seriously in a competitive way. Yeah, having having that like fully encroach upon 40K feels weird. I'm getting used to it. I do feel like everything they've done deliberately that functions in 10th is like good. There's not a change that they've made that like is the way it's supposed to be played that I dislike. I love OC. I think that's way more interesting than OBSEC. It's really fun and creates more dynamic games. I like the way Battleshock works. I like that like your guys actually are affected. I mean, arguably its impact on the game could be stronger, but like that's fine. It, it makes it feel like guys are like actually getting scared and have to like do something about it instead of just like magically poofing away when they get too scared. Balance is obviously a problem, but I'm less worried about that. I think that will get changed with time. I think like the problems of 10th I have are things like consolidation and <laughs> And, and charging and dev wounds being too lethal i think like no matter what it's just going to be too hard to balance honestly i think there will always be like something with dev wounds you can exploit i think it's like fundamentally flawed i think towering is fine if tos start changing their terrain around it but it is feel it does feel kind of sad that work falls on the shoulders of tos now who are like just mostly volunteers like 99 percent volunteers who just do this out of like passion and boarding up all of your windows and ruins is not necessarily what i would call uh like a, a fun passionate activity it's like a chore out of necessity but that's like that's okay uh I'm, I'm sure that'll happen eventually or people will just do what we did this weekend and say buildings like this the towering models can't see through and that's like fine it's really just the stuff that doesn't feel intentional like uh both in the indexes and in like some of the things i broke down here in my last like charge phase video that bothered me about time fly models having to move up and down terrain if they're not like infantry i mean infantry if it doesn't really matter and then if it's like a hive tyrant or something like measuring the base and then like the distance up um and then measuring back down is like a huge pain i think people are just going to start in tournaments at least like carrying extra bases with them which is already a thing for like a lot of european players you know in like ninth but i think it'll be more and more common yeah it's like unclear where models can end their move sometimes a fly in practice it looks fine but i think like on paper it's like uh it's something that's going to cause tension i'm still holding out hope for 10th and i feel like honestly like i can't really complain about it unless i'm constantly constantly playing it and like learning it more and getting good at it so just like uh, the things i learned about consolidation i talked about earlier in this video i'm sure there'll be more things like that i pick up the real playing the game and uh, whenever i do i'll try to mention it in a video but yeah uh this is the most fun i've had playing 10th i think every game this weekend felt like a game even if there was like some more jank than there was at the end of ninth like as, as far as like movement and clarity goes uh yeah they, they felt like real games of warhammer it was a, I mean, it's just like the best part of this game. Wait, let me, there's a very important slide that I forgot to go over. Uh, afterwards, the whole team went to BJ's, which is a West Coast family dining establishment. And we got a Pazuki to celebrate, which is this thing. It's just like, it's a cookie that is like baked like a pie and covered in ice cream and shit. And, uh, yeah, it's just like, that's the best part of Warhammer is eating ice cream after. Uh, it's, it's fun, like hanging out with friends and doing tournaments and stuff. So, uh, as, as much as I, uh, complain about, like, we'll continue to complain about, uh, aspects of 10, I'm not happy with that I think could have been handled a little better uh don't ever think like I don't want people to play Warhammer or I'm like uh so down on the game as a whole but I think like everyone should stop collecting because uh it's it's about having cool space guys at the end of the day and we can all still do that no matter what and uh I am hoping that like as the edition goes on there will be like FAQs and like uh, clarity for some of the rules that feel problematic right now in the core rules and uh, I'm, I'm sure like data sheets will improve over time and like balance will work get itself out so yeah fingers crossed for the future uh, if you've been playing 10 let me know what your thoughts are um and in conclusion for works just yeah just play the mission don't worry about killing stuff we have so many units and they have high oc they're pretty durable orcs are way tougher than they were uh, just just outscore uh use the the strengths that we have don't try to beat people at their own game you gotta you gotta 4d chest them a little bit i think to win right now but it's, it's very possible uh there's not a 10th edition list i've seen yet 
that would be something I'd expect to see in a tournament that I feel like the list I went over today has no play into. Yeah, excited for future practice games. Uh, I'm going to keep grinding. I'm excited to play in GTs and uh, more RTTs in the future and see as people get better and have more knowledge of the edition how this all evolves. So thanks for coming by. If you're new here, uh, I'd like or subscribe or comment. It's always appreciated. And um, yeah, thanks for watching. We're going to have a lot more reviews to come. And uh, for anyone who uh, watched all of this anyways but doesn't actually play or care about competitive stuff that much, uh, uh, we're going to have more painting videos in the future too there's one that i'm like working on finishing right now that'll come up uh probably in like a week or two after this so yeah take care thanks for hanging